Hey everybody, welcome to Verve Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. Verve is a church for people that don't like church. My name is Tony. And my name is Amber Man. Thank you so much for being with us online this morning. Today we're actually continuing in our brand new series called Hot Ones. We're going to be talking about some hot topics. And speaking of hot, let us know in the comment section below what your favorite spot of wings is. And speaking about wings, Tony, we got something <laughs> awesome planned this morning. I hear wings stop. Is the place. Wingstop is Not the place. Not BWs. No, Wingstop. Well, hey, there's a show on YouTube called Hot Ones. If you've ever heard of it, if you've ever seen it, you know it's really funny. This host interviews celebrities about, you know, whatever questions that they're asking. But during the interviews, they're all eating hot, hot, hot wings. And today we have something awesome. <laughs> Our very own Margaret is going to be eating some really oh, hot man. wings and answering some really awesome questions. So check it out. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm Vince Antonucci, the lead pastor of Verve Church. Welcome to Hot Ones, the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. I'm here with Margaret Nitzel, hey. who is the next step pastor at Verve. Welcome to the show, Margaret. Thank you. I'm so sorry. how are you with spice? I'm moderate, but okay. I think we're gonna find out the truth today. Okay, we so will, we'll we will. All right, so we're gonna start with our first wing. Okay. Let's do this. Here we go. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I was born and raised in Las Vegas. I'm married to a wonderful man. His name is Nathan, and we have two kids, Harper and Owen. And uh, here at Verve, I am the Next Steps pastor. So I get to, I get to, it's a pleasure to help people walk through their next steps on their spiritual journey. So it was awesome. You know? Awesome. All right, so hey, our next, our next one has blueberry, which is Ooh. our friend, okay. and ghost pepper, which oh. is not our friend. Okay. So you ready? Yes, let's do it. A little bit of sweetness It starts there. with blueberry. Mm -hmm. And then comes the ghost pepper. You ready? Quick mm. answers. Favorite guilty pleasure cheat day snack? Mm. I could binge on a full bag of Dove chocolate. It has to be dark chocolate though, okay. but there's just something about those little morsels. And I have to eat them when the kids go to bed and when my husband's not around <laughs> because I do not want to share them. Gotcha. Not at all. Favorite place you've ever gone on vacation? Uh, that would have to be Japan for sure. Okay. It's beautiful. I know you're into this kind of stuff. Okay. Favorite power tool? Ooh. I would have to say the miter saw because I've used it on multiple projects and it is. Haven't we all? Oh, right, <laughs> right. And it's great at cutting wood. So. Okay. <laughs> Most important question, Margaret, what's your favorite curse word? <sighs> you're going to make me admit this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you. Okay. Sorry. All right, let's move on to our third wing, which features Carolina Reaper peppers. Okay. Oh. Okay. There's some Carolina Reaper pepper in there. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, oh. that's not fun. <laughs> Margaret, when you Hello. weren't looking, we grabbed your phone okay. <laughs> and we found a picture that I can't explain. But uh, could you explain <laughs> this picture to us? What, what exactly is happening here? What are sure. you doing? Uh, yeah, so my husband and I, whoo, that's hot. Uh, <laughs> We enjoy trying new things. We uh, surf Groupon quite frequently and we found glass blowing. Oh. So we traveled to this random warehouse in this random area mm. of town and we blew glass. Apparently a ton of people have these torches in their garages and they sure. do it from home. <laughs> sure. Uh, I have not gotten this one yet. <laughs> okay. So that's on my to-do list, I think, okay. one day. Margaret, we are about to attempt the bomb, okay. which Sounds is- Sounds scary. Yeah, it's a, it's a life wrecker. Okay. And so we're, we're going to go for it. Here we go. Oh, that's horrible. It just tastes bad. It tastes like a bomb in your mouth. Yeah, it keeps getting worse. So, Margaret, I know. <laughs> know. Oh, this is bad. Oh, it's all in my nose. <laughs> oh, yes. I think that's your sip. <laughs> Margaret, I know you're in a list. Oh. I bet you have a bucket list. I am. <sighs> What's one thing? If there's like, if you're like knew you were only gonna accomplish one more item on your bucket list, what would it be? Not eat hot hot wings again. Um, I would have to say, hold. Oh, I can feel it in my ears. Um, For some reason, it's attacking my nose. <laughs> I really am. I don't know if I can breathe right. Ooh. Okay. I think it would be to live in another country, foreign country. Um, I've never done that. I've traveled a lot, but. Woo. I've never actually lived in a foreign country before, so if I could use one thing, that's what I would do. 
eyes. I feel so bad for you, but I feel worse for me. Oh, yeah. Look at you, Margaret. Four wings up, four wings down. Why did we do I'm this? I'm proud of you. You did it. We did this. Look at the camera and say goodbye. Farewell. Oh, man. Margaret is a trooper. That's yeah, good. painful, bro. Yeah. <laughs> we got to call HR. Vince can't make us do these things. It's too difficult. Well, hey, let's welcome Margaret back. She's recovered from the hot sauce incident. And let's dive into our message time. Have you ever heard of the term green thumb? It's meant to describe someone who has this natural talent for growing plants. Someone who, you, you know, helps them to stay alive. Yeah, that's not me. <laughs> if my thumb was a color, it would be black. Seriously, I've got this thumb of death, man. Um, I've always had all kinds of plants in my life, and I water them. I do. I water them. I put them in sunlight. I follow all the directions on that little card that you get with them. I really do try to keep them alive, but like I said, thumb of death. I tend to kill every plant that I have ever had. That's why when I had my backyard done, I specifically requested plants that are super resilient in the Vegas desert. Because I knew that for anything to survive in my yard, they would have to just survive despite my best efforts. So in our backyard, we have these lantanas. Now, this is not a picture of my lantanas. This is a picture of what lantanas are supposed to look like. And I love lantanas because they're really pretty and they're really colorful and super, super easy to maintain. All you have to do is make sure that they have water, lots of sunlight, and, and occasionally prune them. Um, they're pretty foolproof. Well, surprise, surprise, uh, over the last year, four of my lantanas died. I mean, that's pretty bad. If I have plants that are super resilient, drought resistant, and they still can't survive. Now, this is a picture of my lantanas. It's pretty bad, right? <laughs> Seriously, I need some help. So, um, so this spring, I made it my goal to plant new lantanas and find a way to keep them alive. So I, I took my big pickaxe and I started going to town in the dirt, man. And, and as I was digging in the dirt, I, I discovered some interesting things down there. First, I realized just how much decorative rock was piled on top of my poor dead lantanas. I mean, it took me a while just to get through that first layer. Um, but then inside of the dirt, I pulled out these like huge rocks that were all over my flower bed. And I mean, these things were massive and they were everywhere. And as I was discovering this, I realized that my poor lantanas didn't survive because their roots weren't getting the water that they needed. I mean, how could they with all of that rock piled on top of them and those huge rocks in the dirt that was all blocking the water flow? So after I dug the roots of my old dead lantanas and removed all that rock, I mixed the dirt with some new potting soil and some fertilizer. Um, and I also made sure that the irrigation system had direct access to the roots of the new lantanas that I was putting in so that nothing would prevent them from getting the water that they needed. So what happened? They still died. No, 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 I'm just, just kidding, just kidding, no. They actually, um, they've done great. Um, it was really cool. Me, the person with this thumb of death, was able to figure out how to keep my lantanas alive. I mean, look at these beauties. They're, they're amazing, and they're doing really good. So I'm a little bit proud of myself, I must say. It was a pretty cool experience. Well, today we're going to be talking about roots. And I want you to imagine yourself as a tree. Have you ever done that? 
Well, if not, you should. I mean, look at this guy. He's having a good time, right? He's jamming. So you're a tree, and every tree that I know of has roots. So you're a tree with roots, and you need roots to survive and grow. I mean, without them, you would die, right? Well, have you ever thought about the reason why roots are so important? Like, what do roots actually do, and how does that impact a tree's growth? Well, let's take a look at a few things that roots do to help keep trees alive and growing. And, and I know you may be wondering, man, what, is, what do trees and roots have anything to do with God? I came here to learn about God, not gardening. Well, I promise there is a point here. Just hang in with me for a minute, okay? So the importance of roots. Um, first, roots provide nutrition. In order for trees to survive and grow strong, they have to be planted in nutrient-rich soil that has adequate access to water. I mean, my lantanas are exhibit A of what happens when they're not, right? And roots absorb the nutrients and the water from the ground, and they, they carry them up to the rest of the tree so that it can grow and produce foliage or fruit. Well, did you know that roots also store nutrients and water to, to help prepare for times when that's not readily available? So during times when it's cold outside or there's a drought, the tree can actually still thrive because the roots um, have that water and nutrition put away um, for those times. It's really cool. They literally have a backup plan to make sure that that true tree is adequately fed during any season, whether there's water available or not. That's pretty cool. The second thing that roots do is they provide protection. Uh, roots protect trees from other plants that might try to steal that water or plants that might try to choke and damage the tree. So when roots grow, they, they don't just grow down into the soil. Um, they also extend outward around the base of the tree. And this kind of creates a sense of a, a barrier around where that tree is growing. So when a, when a tree has healthy roots, they help the tree to get stronger and outgrow other competing plants that might steal the water or threaten it. The third thing that roots do is they create a strong foundation. Roots anchor the tree in the ground, so when storms come or there's changes in the environment like soil erosion, the tree can actually remain firmly planted in the soil. Now, take a look at this photo. This, this is amazing. Um, the soil was literally pulled out from underneath this tree, but it stayed strong and tall because of the strength of the roots. It's pretty awesome. Now, unfortunately, there are times when a tree's roots aren't strong enough to withstand a storm or erosion. And when this happens, the tree can't survive. It gets uprooted. Take a look at this next picture. Uh, the roots on this tree are not nearly as deep as the previous one. And look what happened. It couldn't withstand the storm. Did you know that some storms actually help roots to get stronger? I mean, get this, when a tree experiences tension like winds, it causes the tree to sway, right? And we can, we can see that. And when that happens, it's kind of like this workout for the tree and its root system. It's like tree yoga. <laughs> the branches are all contorted and they're moving around and, and the wind actually forces the roots to grab more tightly into the soil. And so what happens is the roots grow stronger. So the tree is able to withstand stronger storms in the future. So roots are super important tr for trees because they provide nutrition, protection, and a firm foundation for the tree to grow. And all of these are necessary for a tree to thrive. So what does this have to do with us? I mean, you just listen to me ramble on and on about how important roots are. But you came here today to learn about God, not trees. So what's the point? Well, the Bible actually refers to trees and roots pretty often. And they, they help us to understand God's desire for our lives. So let's take a look at one example in the Bible um, to show us what we're talking about here. It's in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 to 8. It says, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. 
the trees, such trees not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. So the Bible says that we are blessed when our hope and our confidence are found in God. And the reason is because we're like a tree planted right along a riverbank. Imagine that for a moment. A tree that has constant access to water and nutrition in the soil. They never really feel thirsty or hungry, does it? It's always connected to its source of life. So even on days when it's super hot outside, it doesn't have to worry because it can just drink some more of the water. And that's what it, it's like when we look to God as our source of life, when all our hope and our confidence are in him. Have you ever felt thirsty? Like, have you ever had a time where your lips were chapped or your mouth was dry and all you desperately needed in that moment was a huge glass of water? Well, when my husband and I first got married, I was on this backpacking kick. I loved the idea of like carrying this huge backpack full of gear, hiking to random places and uh, setting up camp overnight. And my husband, he was not so enthusiastic, but we were newlyweds, so he was willing to go with it. Um, so my husband and I did this overnight backpacking trip to the Colorado River. And the trail started at the top of this canyon, and you'd hike downhill into the canyon over these huge boulders, and you'd eventually end up at the Colorado River. And so that's what we did. And once we got to the river, we set up our camp, we settled in for the night, and everything went smoothly. That is until we woke up the next morning. Uh, we realized that somehow our water had leaked out, leaving us with a much smaller water supply for the hike out that day. Now the problem was that we had to hike uphill to get out of the canyon in the middle of July in the desert. And about halfway up the canyon, we completely ran out of water. And that canyon started to get hot. And I mean hot. I mean, if you've ever been in Vegas in the middle of the summer without any shade, on a black asphalt frying an egg, you still don't understand, okay? This was like fire all around us. Canyons tend to trap heat in like an incubator. So the July desert temperature, it was crazy intense. And at that point, the only thing that we could do was try to make it to our car as fast as possible. But remember, we were hiking uphill, no shade, no water in the middle of a hot canyon. So we started getting dizzy. Our sight started getting hazy and dark. And honestly, we wondered if we'd ever even make it out. Luckily, we did run into a woman who had a few extra bottles of water that she shared with us. And oh, let me tell you, it was glorious. This was probably the best tasting water that I had ever had. Uh, unfortunately, it still wasn't quite enough water to get us out of the canyon, but it did help temporarily, and, but it didn't last. I mean, I think that's the closest that we came to being in pretty serious danger. Uh, we were close to giving up. We started, we started talking about writing our last wishes in the dirt, just in case anyone were to find us on their way in or out of the canyon. Like this was, this was serious. Now, luckily we did make it out of the canyon and we did make it to the nearest gas station to get some water. Man, I was so happy. I literally almost climbed into the refrigerator at the gas station. It was the most beautiful moment in my life. But we were thirsty. I mean, really thirsty. Are you thirsty? Like really thirsty? And, and I don't mean for, for water. I mean in life. Do you feel like something's missing? Like you're desperate to quench your thirst? And are you, are you questioning whether you'll make it unless you find out, whether you figure out what it is that you are longing for? Well, those, verse, those verses in Jeremiah, they, they tell us that we're really thirsty for God, more of God. That the only thing that will sustain us in times of drought 
is Jesus. In fact, Jesus told us that whoever comes to him will never be thirsty. Check out what it says in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. It says, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Jesus is shouting to the crowds. He's shouting to you and me, if you're thirsty, come to me. I will quench your thirst. And the verses we read before in Jeremiah say that the way that happens is by having our roots embedded in the riverbank, embedded in Jesus, so that we have a constant supply of water. So where are you rooted? Where have you planted your life? And is it filling you up? Or is it just leaving you longing for something more, something deeper, something real? In the Bible, there's this guy named Paul, who was the leader in the church after Jesus came to earth. And he traveled all over to tell, G uh, to, to tell people about Jesus. And there was this church in Colossae that was being influenced by people who were telling them that Jesus was not actually God. So, so Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians to help address this issue and to remind them about staying rooted in Jesus. And he started his letter by reminding them who Jesus actually is. Let's take a look at what he wrote in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. He says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything and in the heavenly realms and on earth. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. This is pretty strong language about Jesus. Paul's saying that Jesus wasn't just some dude that popped up out of nowhere who started teaching people. Like Jesus was God in physical form. And how many times do we forget this? How many times do we just go about life behaving like Jesus is just some guy that we talk to when it's convenient, when we need or want something? Well, Paul continues by saying this. He says, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. Paul reminds us that God sent Jesus because it was the only way sinful humans, we, could be reunited with him. And he was pleased to do it. Because his love for us is so huge and so intense that he would do whatever it takes to be reunited with us. He would sacrifice everything for us to be with him. That's huge. I love what Paul says next. He says, this includes you who were once far away from God. This includes you. Despite who you are, despite what you've done, Despite what you think about yourself, you are reunited with God when you decide to put your faith in and follow Jesus. Isn't that cool? Jesus doesn't exclude anyone. We are all included in his offer to be reunited with God. But then Paul makes a transition in his letter. He starts talking about what we need to do now that we know this, now that we understand who Jesus is that he is God's son, and he died to reconcile us to God. Paul gives us these instructions in chapter 1, verses 23. He said, But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. 
A little bit later in chapter 2, Paul says this in verses 6 through 8. He says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Continue to believe. Stand firm. Don't drift away. Let your roots grow down into Jesus and build your lives on him. These are the instructions Paul gives us. And then your faith will grow strong. Then you will overflow with thankfulness and all that you need to live a full and abundant life. You see, it's more than just believing. It's more than just saying, yeah, I believe that Jesus lived and died and he was raised from the dead for my sins. I believe that. It's more than that. It's about building your entire life on him, about being rooted in him in a way that defines your identity. It's about building a foundation in him that when those winds come, when the stability around you erodes away, when your roots are so deeply embedded in him that you stand firm and you withstand all that life throws at you. He is your source of water. He is your source of life. And that can be easy to say, can it? The hard part is actually living this out. Our culture tells us that we should build our lives on things like money or fame or sexuality or entertainment or social media, other people. And all of those things can be really appealing. Maybe for you, you've rooted yourself in something like a relationship that you're desperately trying to gain approval from, but all you experience is rejection. Or maybe it's a habit or an addiction that promises to bring you joy and fulfillment, but ultimately it just leaves you empty. Maybe it's a career and the, the hope of a lavish lifestyle that leaves you still wanting more. And when the winds blow, when the storms come, because they will, will those things help you stand firm? Will they give you abundant joy-filled life? Or will they leave you thirsty? Will they cause you to uproot or wither away? So what does it look like to root yourself in Jesus? Is it even possible or realistic? Well, it's, it's really not complicated. There's no secret that you have to discover. It's really just you making the choice to prioritize things that root you in Jesus every single day. And there are some really practical ways that you can do that. First, you make it a daily practice to spend time with God in prayer and reading the Bible. And, and that might mean that you have to make some sacrifices or some difficult decisions about how you spend your time or what you value. But if you want to root yourself in Jesus, maybe the sacrifice is worth it. Second, you live in authentic and consistent community with other people who are also rooting themselves in Jesus. At Verb, we have groups designed to help you get connected to other Ververs who are also growing in their faith. In fact, Discover's coming up in July, and it's a really great place to start. Um, there's also another group experience coming up in the fall called Rooted, and it's a 10-week experience that's really designed to help you dig in to your relationship with God. Maybe that's something you could do. Next, you use your gifts and your talents to invest in God's mission and care for other people. God designed each of us to contribute to his work and to care for others. And there are so many ways that, um, that we can do that at Verve or in the community that you find yourself in. Maybe you have a heart for the homeless or children in poverty. Could you dedicate some time consistently to give to the people in need? 
Or maybe you could volunteer with the Verb online community to make sure that we reach more people who need to hear about God. Finally, you give generously so that God's work can be multiplied. When we invest financially in God's mission, we're allowing God to do work in our lives and the lives of others. We're making an investment in things that go far beyond our finances and make a deep, long-lasting impact. You can do this. You can make the decision every day to plant yourself firmly along the riverbank that gives you life and meaning. So what does it look like for you? What steps do you need to take today to become more firmly rooted in Jesus and live the abundant life he has for you? I want to leave you with a final prayer. And this prayer was written by Paul to another church in a city called Ephesus. And it's a prayer that I've prayed for myself and for other people. Um, it means a lot to me, and I'd like to share it with you as we close and allow you to reflect on what all of this might look like for you to become more firmly rooted in your relationship with God. So this prayer is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 21. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Amen.
behind me every day of my life. Ever before me, ever behind me, every day. Thank you so much for being with us here at Verve Online. If you are new to Verve, we'd love for you. We'd love to get to know you. So go to verve.cc on your phone or on your computer. It'll take you about 90 seconds, but you just click this I'm new emblem and fill out the information. All you're going to get in the mail is a letter and some pop rocks and the letter will describe what the pop rocks are all about. Totally. And also if you're not new at verve.cc, you can also give. Those of us who call Verve home love to give because it helps us make an impact locally, but also globally. Remember also, if you're thinking about how to make Verve uh, online your church, you can totally do that. We would love to help you take some next steps. Could be joining a group, a rooted group, or an alpha group. It could be getting involved in service. When you fill out that I'm new connection card, you're going to get a phone call or a connection, maybe a text or an email from one of the online hosts, and we're gonna walk you through how to get connected more to Verve. So make sure you fill out that, that I'm new connection card. Yeah, well, hey, we end every single service the same way by shouting the word, Viva La Verve. And Verve is actually an actual word that means full, enthusiastic, abundant lives. So we'll see you guys next week as we continue in our series, Hot Ones. But until then, and as always, Viva La Verve. Viva La Verve. <laughs>